The drive to Algonquin Park lasted longer than expected. After running into traffic and making a few wrong turns along the way, we got there late in the afternoon. My dad paid the fees at the front gate and proceeded to drive the remaining kilometers into the park. We eventually found our way to the canoe launch and got out of the van, stretching our legs. My dad and Uncle Steve were looking over the maps, which appeared to have been hand, drawn by park rangers and were encased in clear plastic. I watched as they traced the route we would be traveling. They both agreed that it shouldn't be too complicated to make it to the campground, despite the fact that we had been delayed getting there. A little bit late in the day to start a portaging trip, said a park ranger to my dad as we were packing the last of our camping supplies into the canoes. We're meeting up with some friends who are out there waiting for us. They've already set up camp, so we've just got to make it to the island. Well, be careful. Once it gets dark in Algonquin, it becomes a whole different world. You folks be safe now. Thanks, we will. My dad had lectured us the whole way there in a similar fashion, and I couldn't help but grin to hear him getting a taste of his own medicine. Apparently, there were people who got lost in the park every year, never to be seen again. There were bears and wolves, coyotes, and other animals in the wilderness, and we would be guests in their domain. I climbed into the front of one boat, and my uncle took a seat at the back. My brother was in the other canoe, and my dad climbed in awkwardly, nearly tipping it over in the process. The water was crystal, clear and pristine, and I could see minnows swimming in the shallows, frogs and tadpoles. I took a deep breath in, enjoying the crisp, fresh air of the northern outdoors, and admired a great blue heron that was resting in the shade nearby. Paddling along the river, we found our way towards a lake, which opened up before us, revealing our first glimpse at the pristine beauty of the provincial park. The silence was overwhelming. Away from car mufflers and computer fans and the constant noise of the city, the sense of sudden peace was overwhelming. All I could hear was the sound of my paddle, slicing through the calm water, and the occasional call of a bird from the surrounding pine forest that engulfed us. Other trees and plant life lined the lake as well, maples and white birches. Some pale-looking twisted trees sprang from the high cliffs above, growing against all odds, their roots hanging on from rocky outcrops that ranged in rusty reddish colors. My brother Noel and my dad were struggling with their canoe coordination. Noel and I frequently went fishing using the canoes at our cabin when we went up there, so I knew he wasn't the one having issues. It was my dad. My dad had never operated a canoe before, I realized in that moment. Although he'd spoken confidently saying he knew what he was doing, he was struggling. He had insisted on sitting in the rear of the canoe, which is the most crucial position in the boat, since you act as the rudder, and also the primary source of power. Noel was fruitlessly paddling away up front, while my dad lackadaisically slapped at the water, sending the boat veering back and forth in a zigzag pattern. His ineffectual efforts eventually caused no efforts, eventually caused Noel to get slightly annoyed, and I heard them bickering with each other. I looked back at them, trailing far behind us, and saw their twisting, turning path was taking them all over the lake, whereas we were traveling in more or less a straight line. Has your dad ever paddled a canoe before? Steve asked. I think it's been a while by the looks of it. Oh, boy. Maybe he should let Noel steer. Yeah, I'll suggest it at the first stop. We arrived at the first place, where we had to portage across a short stretch. For those who aren't familiar, this means you have to carry your canoe across dry land for a little ways to get to the next river or lake, so that you can continue your trip. If you have a cooler and luggage and other items. You have to hike back and forth sometimes two or three times. This is when it comes in handy to pack light. It took us two trips to bring everything, including the canoes, to the other side. The hike between lakes was about ten minutes, so it wasn't too strenuous. That was the easy one, according to the map, my Uncle Steve said. The next one is much further. Great, I thought to myself. I guess it'll be my job to carry the cooler again, too. We got back in the carved wooden boats and started paddling once more. My uncle had the map and was directing us which way to go, while my brother followed with my dad in the other canoe. At least he had managed to get him to switch seats, though. As we went along, I saw they were now keeping pace with us. 
with Noel at the rear of the boat generating more power and his more experienced paddling, keeping them on course. What do you guys know about the legends of the Algonquin? My uncle asked us, making conversation. He and my dad both had a wealth of knowledge on various topics, but things like this were my uncle's specialty. He was an avid outdoorsman and a skilled fisherman who took a deep interest in Aboriginal culture and the stories they told over generations. Nothing, really, I said. So you've never heard of the Mamegwisi? We all stayed silent and waited for him to explain. My uncle was a bit of a jokester as well, so it was hard to tell if he was kidding sometimes. He liked to put on a straight face and tell an elaborate lie in the form of a story, just to take you along for the ride. So we waited to see if he was trying to fool us before answering yes or no. They're water spirits. Mischievous little buggers. They'll steal your camping supplies if you're not careful. Food, clothes, fishing rods, whatever they like. And they can send your canoe off course, too. You'll be just paddling along like we are now, and the Mengwezi will send you off from the proper course, and you'll wind up lost. If you don't show them the proper respect, that is. <laughs> Enough with that, Steve. Quit trying to scare the kids with that crap. We're barely going to make it to the campsite before dark as it is. Turn right up ahead, here. The map says it's going to be over this way. We veered our boats over in that direction at my dad's insistence, and I noticed we were in a very shallow section full of reeds and plants. The canoes were almost touching the bottom of the lake. Should we go this way? I don't think that's what the map is saying. My uncle was looking at the narrow river doubtfully. The area we were headed towards looked like a swamp, and mosquitoes were already beginning to land on me and bite my neck as we got closer. My dad and uncle pondered over the map for a while, and my brother and I sat there and slapped at the bugs landing on us. Eventually, they decided to take the route which led us down the shallow, winding river surrounded by tall reeds. I could tell by the silence of them both that they were not sure if this way was correct. The further we got, and the more time passed, I noticed the sun had begun to set. Pretty soon, it was almost dark outside, and the water eventually became so shallow that it nearly dried up. The river had turned into a muddy creek, and we were forced to turn around. <laughs> oh, my dad said, we must have gone the wrong way. We'll have to go back to that lake. I think I read the map wrong. My uncle bit his tongue, and we paddled back against the current. The lake was empty, and it was completely dark by the time we got back to it. There was no moon that night, and nothing to light our way. My dad told me to get out a flashlight and cast the beam toward shore, looking for a reflective sign with a symbol for a portage point. Just keep that flashlight pointed at the shore and tell us if you see a reflective sign anywhere, Jordan. This next portage should take us to the lake with the campsite, so there shouldn't be too much farther to go off till we find it. My heartbeat was quickening with anxious fear as our canoes traveled along near the shore in almost total darkness. I swung the flashlight beam around to check for deadheads and rocks in our path and told my uncle to veer left or right to avoid hitting things that would have tipped us over. We gotta be careful. Don't want to fall into these waters. There's another legend that the people of this area used to speak of, my uncle said while he paddled, trying to distract us from the precarious situation we'd gotten ourselves into. The Mishijinabig. It's a huge horned serpent. It lives in lakes. And eats people. Okay, Steve. That's about enough. My dad was yelling when my ears caught a sound that I couldn't place. It was steady and persistent, coming from just head. The canoes were picking up speed. I looked back and saw that my dad and uncle weren't paddling, weren't paddling, weren't paying attention at all. They were just arguing with each other about who had taken the wrong turn. You and your ridiculous legends. You're distracting us all with this. This useless garbage. Don't say that. You're going to upset them. You're going to upset them. You should apologize. I finally managed to find my voice and I yelled back at them. There's a waterfall up ahead. We're paddling towards a waterfall. They chuckled and told me that was ridiculous. There was no waterfall on the map. Then they began to bicker again and I started to get extremely nervous. The canoes were moving faster and faster, but nobody was paddling anymore. I was just a kid, so they weren't listening to me. Can't you see what's happening? I yelled at them. Look how fast we're moving. There's a waterfall up ahead. They abruptly stopped arguing 
and now the sound of rushing water could be distinctly heard from up ahead. Okay, let's start paddling towards shore. I think we need to start paddling towards shore. I think we need to start paddling towards shore right now. My dad was trying to sound calm, but I could hear the panic in his voice. We all began to paddle as hard as we could. In the dim light, I could barely see anything but the silhouette of trees all around us and the ink. Black water of the lake. Shimmering reflections of stars were floating on the surface of it, speeding past at an increasing rate. We began to make some headway getting closer to the shoreline, but then suddenly our efforts became futile. We were being sucked in, drawn inextricably towards the waterfall. I looked ahead and saw it drawing close. The night sky sat surreally above the surface of the turbulent black water, which flowed downwards, disappearing from sight. And when I saw how close it was, I screamed... Watching in horror, I saw us go over the edge and the world tipped sickeningly upside, down as I fell. Becoming weightless was a harrowing experience, as for a moment I floated through the air, my screams echoing out into the night. The wolves howled in response and I descended, looking down to see jagged rocks waiting for us below. Far, far, far down below. We fell and our screams echoed across the lake. I tried to point my feet downwards, afraid of what might happen if I impacted the water incorrectly. After what felt like forever, I landed in the frigid depths below. The surface of it hit me with so much force that it nearly knocked the wind out of me, and I struggled to breathe as I gasped from the cold sinking downwards. The weight of my boots dragged me below, and I kicked, trying to get them off my feet. They felt like cinder blocks— and as my head dipped beneath the surface of the water, I gulped it in, and it went up my nose, stinging my sinuses. I called out for help, but my pleas were drowned by the water once more. My head went under again, and this time I stayed down longer, struggling to get back to the surface. I looked around in the murky water and saw a pair of eyes glaring back at me from the depths, yellow eyes that were unblinking and massive, glowing in the darkness. A tipped over canoe was close by when I got to the surface, and I grabbed hold of it and took a gasping breath of air. My dad and brother were okay, I saw, and my uncle had survived the fall, too, although his head sustained a large gash and he appeared dazed and hurt. You need to apologize, Dave, my uncle told my father, sounding drunk now, his words slurred and difficult to understand. You've disrespected the spirits here. Apologize before they kill us all. What? Those stories you were telling to scare the kids. Are you still talking about that shit? Suddenly, I felt something wrap around my ankle, and although I held onto the canoe as firmly as I could, I felt myself being dragged down. There was no time to scream, but I tried to take a breath of air before being pulled down below. My uncle's hand reached down and managed to grab mine, and he held onto me for dear life. I felt like I would be pulled in two as the thing from the depths tore at my leg, yanking me downwards. As the time passed beneath the water, my need to breathe became more urgent. I began to thrash and kick my legs, trying desperately to free myself from the thing which was pulling me down. My heartbeat was loud and fast in my ears, and I looked in terror to see the yellow eyes of the thing were very close now. It was coming towards me, and in the black, murky water, I could just barely make out its massive horned head and gaping maw, Huge fangs and a split tongue could be seen in the dim light as the snake came face to face with me. The massive beast was so large it could swallow me whole, I realized, and I cringed and waited for that to happen, momentarily resigned to my fate. But then a light shone down from the surface. A bright torch lamp made the snake cringe and recoil in fear. It loosened its grip on my leg, and I felt my uncle pull me towards the surface. My vision was clouding red and black, and as I began to feel like I was passing out, I broke through the surface of the water and was pulled up onto a large canoe. Our friends who had been at the campsite waiting for our arrival had heard us screaming as we went over the waterfall. The campsite was close by, and they had quickly gotten in their boat to come rescue us once they realized what had happened. If not for them, we would have been dead. At least so it seemed. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. My dad was repeating the words over and over. It's not your fault, Dave. These things happen, his friend Randy was saying, as we paddled over towards the campsite. At least, nobody got hurt, right? That's the important thing. 
My uncle rubbed his bleeding forehead and rolled his eyes at me. Thanks, Uncle Steve, I said to him quietly. He nodded and said, no problem, kitty. I saw the horned serpent down there, Uncle Steve. I think you're right. We should probably be respectful of the creatures around here. I don't want to get on that guy's bad side again. He smiled, his eyes shining red for just a second in the moonlight, and I noticed his face appeared different, like someone else entirely. Like someone else entirely, a being which had been sent to help us, both ancient and wise. Just wait until I tell you the tale of the great rabbit. I've got plenty of stories, and each with a lesson. For those who will listen, and who have ears to hear, he put two fingers up over his head, making little bunny ears, and smiled. This happened when I was younger. I'm probably ten years old or so. I was with my family, and we were on a hike when we came across this old train. Naturally, I was curious and wanted to climb on it. My dad told me it was unsafe and told me to stay on the ground. I was disappointed, but I listened. We started walking away. I looked back to see if anybody else was interested in checking it out with me. My dad now was about a hundred feet ahead of me, since I was kind of dragging my feet, but I saw a figure boarding the train. So I stood there for a minute, and then realized that I was the last one standing there. I was scared. My dad was far enough away now that I was sure the figure was not him. Of course, I mean, there's no way it could have been, and it was acting a little hostile. I decided the best thing to do was to run. This figure that stepped in the train now stepped out, and I could tell it looked like a man, but was really tall and appeared naked. So I ran as fast as I could back to my dad, and I didn't want to talk about the train. I'm not sure if anybody else around on the trail saw, but I can't forget it. I've always wondered what that train car was doing there. It was this old, rusty, dilapidated, beat-down train car, kind of just dumped off in the middle of the woods, not too far off the trail. Just for your... for your information, we had a park ranger officer stop us down the ways, ask us, stop us down the ways, ask us what we were doing, and we told him what we have found. He just looked at us strangely and explained to us there was no old abandoned train back that way and then spent the next five minutes convincing us we were wrong. I really don't know what to make of it, but wow, it was so strange. The most interesting thing I've ever seen when I was working as a ranger up in the mountains, and came across this large cavern. I was off duty at the time, but that was my current career. I had to rappel down it to take a look. When I was down into it, I saw these weird markings on the wall. I tried to take a picture with my flashlight, but my flash would not work. I had to go up to get a better flashlight. When I took the picture, well, it appeared to be a figure in the center of the cavern. I was never able to fully prove this on photo, but I'm pretty sure the cave drawings were not done by natives. I also think that the whole area should be investigated by anthropologists. It's possible that I was able to see remnants of some sort of ancient civilization. The cave opened up into a massive chamber. It was possible for somebody to even seek shelter in there. I also think the whole area should have been investigated for potential sites. The figure in the center carved out of a wall was holding a spear. The spear was pointing towards, well, the entrance of the cave. I think that it's possible. Someone was trying to warn me not to come down there. It's a scary thought, but upon closer inspection, the figure was actually carved out of lava rock. Loose details, but still a man with a spear. The figure was carved into the wall, and there was no evidence that it had been moved at any time or way. There were two walls with cave drawings on them. There was a third wall without drawings on it. This was the wall of the figure that was carved into it. And maybe not exactly scary, but more mysterious and very interesting. Last summer, I was out with a friend who was driving around. We were out near the end of a road in Big Bend National Park. So I asked, where do you think we are exactly? And he just told me he has no idea. There were no landmarks. And we looked down to the distance only to see sky and trees ahead of us. He says, I sure hope we're somewhere because I don't want to be lost. I'm sure we're somewhere, though this is road after all, and we got a destination. So I told him. 
I don't want to be a pessimist, but he kept pressing on. I know where we're going. You don't have to worry. We don't have to worry. We're going to a place that's by the Colorado River. They have everything we need. So, a little while later, we see this car coming toward us. The driver was a park ranger. I'm like, look, we found somebody now. We can get directions. So we kind of flag him down and pull over, and the ranger quickly pulls over his truck. Fast, as if he's on a mission or in a panic. He kind of races out of his truck, and he has a very concerned look on his face. He begins kind of interrupting us and asks us nervously, what we're doing, where we're going, where we're going, where we... we tell him. As we're telling him, he cuts us off mid-sentence and just tells us it's not safe. We need to get out of here. Extremely confused, we start asking him what he's talking about. He was patrolling this road a few hours ago and saw a man die out here. We had asked him. He tells us there's a large unknown canine that had just mauled a man to death not too long ago. That's the second body that's been found mauled to death in the last couple of months. He went on to say there's been a recent increase of sightings of this animal, which has been confirmed to be a very large canine of some kind. We kind of just nod stupidly. I mean, not really sure what to say or how to react, and he's already getting back in his truck at this point, trying to get out of there. He gets back in his truck, waves us, and drives off. So we're still looking at each other like, did that just happen? And right as we get back in the car, before the engine even gets turned on, we both get this really weird feeling come over us. It was a feeling of eminent danger, like neither of us were safe, like we needed to leave now. I looked at my friend and was like, you need to start the car right now and we need to go. We got out of there and haven't talked about that day or time since. I do think about it from time to time, and it was very weird. I don't know what to make of it. I'm just glad we didn't end up getting killed or eaten. My husband and I were on a trip to Mount Rushmore and Yellowstone. We were currently in the process of stopping in Cody, Wyoming, on our way home. This is where Yellowstone National Park is. This is where Yellowstone National Park is. There's a cute little town with shops and restaurants. It is only a short drive to the park. While we are looking at the shops, I noticed a man in ranger-type clothing. I'm not sure if this is a park ranger or not at the time, but I thought it was odd that he was wearing ranger clothing while in town. I mentioned this to my husband just because it was weird. We continued shopping. Later in the day, I see this man again, this time, though, in the Walmart parking lot. He was just standing there by his truck. I remember that he was wearing the same clothing. That's how I identified him. He appeared to be watching people as they came into the parking lot. I told my husband again, he just said, Well, he's probably just wearing the uniform because either he's off-duty or maybe it is authentic and he likes wearing it. And I just kind of dismissed the thought. After we finished shopping for some groceries, we were walking to the car. I noticed him again. He was now standing in front of his truck, and he was watching people, just like before. I don't know why, but you know how your gut just tells you certain things about certain people. Yeah, that's what my gut was doing to this guy. And now I was beginning to get a little nervous. I said to my husband, I really don't like the way this man is acting. He's really watching people intently. My husband is like, well... He's probably just doing his job honorable, so we get in the car and we're driving off. As we're pulling out, he just stares at us, watching us drive off. I looked back and be like, well, he's watching people weirdly. My husband asked me, what does that mean? What do you mean he's watching people weirdly? And so I was like, I don't know. He just, I have a feeling okay. So a couple of days pass and we go to check in for our room at a hotel near the park. Well, I noticed that man again is standing there in the lobby. I don't know if he was watching us or what, but he was looking at the board. And I say to my husband, there's that man again. I don't like him and I don't trust him. Just as my husband starts to say something, the park ranger turns to look at us directly in the eyes, like he knew we were talking about him. I almost gasped audibly. His eyes, his eyes weren't normal. They were like a snake's reptilian they were slits within a half second they changed back to regular eyes like a person has and he just wore this angry expression on his face before turning back to doing whatever he was doing 
So we know, but out of their well again, the next day we're on our way to the park. And we see him again. We're driving on the main road in town, and he is just walking. He sees us, stops, and blatantly begins waving at us. He's again wearing the same uniform. It's clearly the same man. Nobody else is walking around town in the same park ranger uniform, and he is standing right next to a tourist shopping area. As he is watching us, we're driving off. He again had this angry expression on his face. So we get to the park and are walking to the lodge. As we're walking, I see him again. And this is later in the evening, might you. I know he's following us. The man was standing there watching us very intently. Just us. Nobody else. He was wearing a ranger hat this time, unlike other times. And even had his vest on. He still had that angry look on his face and kind of a smirk. He turned away quickly and walked into a small little gift shop. This is where the story turns. I don't want to give anything away, but this is a creepy story. After he went in there, my husband and I went into the lodge to get a cup of coffee. We were going to meet my in-laws for dinner, and while we were in the lodge, I noticed the man standing there by the door, staring at us again. He was again wearing the same clothes, so there's no mistaking him. A man sitting at the table next to us looked over and said, See that man there? Don't trust him. He's not really a ranger. He's very dangerous, and from the looks of it, he's been scouting you two out. The fact that a mere stranger would point that out to us, without even knowing who we were or situation, was undoubtedly terrifying. We just got up and left right there. I think we had a short phone call with the in-laws about not building able to meet up, but we felt like our lives were at stake. We booked it out of town shortly thereafter. When I was a kid, my cousins and I had mostly free range over the Appalachian State Park where we lived, and during the summer, we would stay out most of the day and play in the woods. We had a fort set up deep in the forest that had a nice little river and was close enough to the trails that we could reasonably get back for snacks or whatever. One day, when I was about eight, I was exploring a part of the woods that was across the mountain highway road, so it wasn't as familiar to me. I remember trying to weave through the rhododendron and trees when I ran directly into an older woman. She said something to me, although I don't remember what it was because I was so shocked. I looked over to see a skinny tall guy sitting by a tent and a makeshift fire. These days, I live in Los Angeles, so I see scenes like this outside my office building and home due to the number of houseless folks in the area. But I was probably ten miles away from any kind of gas station and twenty-five from a Walmart. Finding a random camp in the woods scared the shit out of me as an eight-year-old. Turns out they were local moonshiners that also grew a decent amount of weed, and I'd stumbled upon their spot. The competing moonshiner in the area used his COVID stimulus check to open a legal distillery a few years ago. So I wonder how the tent people are holding up these days. Thanks for listening, our stories. If you'd like to support us, do hit that like button, subscribe, and hit a notification bell. Thank you, ghouls.